преди да започнем нашето събитие, ми се иска да поканя и Саймон Дженър, който е представител на Axiom Space, нашата партньорска организация, благодарение на която днес имаме а, възможността да се срещнем с Майкъл Лопес Алегрия. А, искам да поканя Саймон на сцената. Саймон, you welcome. Welcome to the stage. Благодаря. Здравейте! So this is going to be a warm-up presentation for our main act tonight, astronaut Michael Lopez Alegria. Uh, and like many comedy warm-up acts, this is going to be interactive, so you guys are going to get involved. I hope everybody's ready for this. So I've called my presentation Astronaut Facts Countdown. Uh, so you might uh, have a guess at what is coming. But first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the company that Michael and I both work for, Axiom Space. Uh, for those of you that have seen me present before, this is going to be old news to you, but for, there might be some new people in the audience. So Axiom Space is doing three big things. Firstly, we are building the first commercial space station. Uh, we are attaching our space station to the International Space Station, with our first module being launched in 2026, uh, growing the habitable volume of the space station by four astronauts. A year later, in 2027, we're going to have enough space for another four astronauts when we launch our second module. Our third module, about a year after that, is going to be a research and manufacturing uh, facility. And then finally, this window here and the power tower uh, being launched as well. The idea is that towards the end of this decade, when the International Space Station has reached the end of its useful life, we are providing the replacement for it so that humanity can continue to have a presence in low Earth orbit. We are also, and Michael is going to talk a lot about this, uh, the only company in the world that is flying private astronaut missions to the International Space Station. So we have flown three fully private crews to the International Space Station thus far, uh, the first of which in 2022, which Michael commanded, the second of which was commanded by Dr. Peggy Whitson, uh, one of our other uh, Axiom astronauts and former NASA astronaut. And then our third mission, which Michael came back from earlier this year, our AX3 mission, uh, was the first all European mission to the ISS. You'll hear a lot more about that shortly. And then the third thing that we do is build spacesuits. So we are building this spacesuit for humanity's return to the lunar surface. We're also building spacesuits for our own space station to give our astronauts, our customers, the opportunity to go outside and see the wonders of the Earth from above and then look out to see the beauty of the stars with almost nothing in between oh. them. <clears throat> so that's what we do. If you're interested in more about that, go check out our website or come see me afterwards, and we can talk about that. In the meantime, it is time to start our countdown. So audience involvement. I think we can all agree that was awful. We're going to try that again. I think we can agree that's slightly better. We're going to do it one more time. Awesome. You guys are awesome. All right, fact number five. Astronauts would be amazing to have on your pub quiz team. So why do I say this? So every astronaut that I have met knows a lot about a lot. Uh, they are generally very competent people even before they ever become an astronaut. In fact, that is usually one of the reasons why they get selected to be an astronaut. And then during their training, they are trained to be multi-skilled. So you'll find that astronauts are trained to be medical technicians, they're trained to be research assistants, they're trained to be uh, often pilots, they're trained to be all sorts of different things, toilet repair people. Uh, so if you're looking for someone to add to your pub quiz team, Michael is here until Friday morning. Sweet talk him and see what happens. Are you ready? Yeah. Fact number four. Astronauts are just like you, except for when they're not. All right, so what do I mean by that? What do I mean by that? Astronauts come in all shapes and sizes. The one thing that they have in common, of course, is they're extremely capable people, but they come from all different backgrounds. Uh, some astronauts are pilots, and this is a pretty common career pathway to get into astronautics. 
But of course you have scientists, you have researchers, there have been school teachers that have flown. And in future we're going to see artists. We're going to see people from all walks of life, uh, all career backgrounds, all different countries flying to space. And including, in the future, probably, hopefully, one of you in the audience. Are we ready? Wait, let's do that again. There we go. All right, fact number three. Astronauts, despite everything you think you may know about them, are not superhuman. I know when I was growing up, the impression that I had about what it took to be an astronaut was that you had to be this amazing physical specimen. You had to be an athlete, a weightlifter, you had to be in perfect medical health. Uh, and while Michael might be almost the perfect physical specimen, uh, the other astronauts don't necessarily need to be. What this means for you as an audience, as an audience, one of which, or two of which, or a few of which might become Bulgaria's next astronaut, is that in order to become an astronaut, you need to be pretty healthy, but you don't need to be in perfect fitness, you don't need to be super strong, you don't need to be able to run faster than everybody else. They're not superhumans, but they're amazing. Moving on. All right, so the crowd's getting a bit quieter as we go through. We're going to do that again. Wait a second, wait a second. All right, very good, very good. Astronauts are failures. Astronauts fail a lot. Every astronaut I know has failed so many things so many times. I know astronauts that have failed their driving test. So many astronauts have failed their subjects at school, high school, university. Uh, astronauts have failed. An astronaut I know, and I won't name names, has failed to stop a very expensive <coughs> aircraft by the end of the runway. Astronauts have failed their marriages. Astronauts, almost all the time, have failed to get into astronaut school, to get into the astronaut selection. Most astronauts take one, take two, three, five more times to apply for and to get into the astronaut selection. But the one thing they don't do is give up. So let's go to the last slide. And lucky last, astronauts dream big, and they don't let no get in the way of their dreams. And I think this is a lesson particularly for the kids that are here in the audience. If there is something which you are dreaming of doing today, you can do it. And you might have people, you might have well-meaning people in your lives that try and suggest to you that you can't. You might have a school teacher that tells you, that might try and tell you that you are dreaming too big and maybe you should aim lower. Every astronaut has probably had somebody tell them no along their journey. And every astronaut that I have met is an astronaut. They didn't let that no get in the way of their dreams. All right, you guys have been great, and I think you deserve a real countdown. So let's give a countdown for Michael Lopez Alegria. Round of applause for Michael, please. Наша гост тази вечер е с над 40 години опит в небето и в космоса. Държи рекорд за най-много излизания в открития космос, цели 10 и близо 67 часа и 40 минути в същия този студен и безкраен космос. Изключителен човек, който днес така имаме привилегията да, да видим и да се срещнем с него. Предлагам директно да започваме. Той мисля, че е готов. Нека да аплодираме. Майкъл Лопес Алегрия. Okay. 
Dobry wieczór. I have to uh, try to do better than Simon, the warm-up act. Let's, let's have a round of applause for Simon. Did a great job. We, uh, we call Simon our ecosystem manager. I'm really not sure what that means, but I think we may change the title to something with a comedian because it was pretty funny. So, um, I understand a little bit about uh, ratio, what the, uh, the rationale behind it is, um, but I think the context that I'm picking up is that in addition to being rational thinkers, you're also space nerds, is that correct? Okay, good. So I'm gonna have uh, two pieces of this presentation. The first, as Simon mentioned, I, I wanna talk a little bit about private astronaut missions mostly about training, and if you heard him say accurately, by the way, that astronauts are just like you or you are just like astronauts, it's 100% true. So I, I want you to think, when you see these images of my crewmates from both AX1 and AX3 in training, this really could be you. This is a, a real possibility. Um, I think it's high time for a Bulgaria to have its third astronaut, and fourth and fifth and sixth, and so I hope you're equally inspired. Uh, I don't, I could not understand my, the presentation, so I will introduce myself briefly. I was born in Madrid, Spain, but when I was quite small, a year and a half, we moved to the United States, so I grew up uh, mostly American, but my father Spanish, my mother was American of Italian descent, so I have a lot of Latin blood. Uh, but a lot of American culture. Uh, I was a pilot in the Navy. I was hired by NASA in 1992 with group number 14 of the astronauts, so the 14th selection since the very first one in 1959. Um, I've been very fortunate to do some spacewalks, and I also spent um, some time at the bottom of the sea in a, what was then an experimental idea called uh, NASA Extreme Environment Mission Operations. So this is a habitat that's in about uh, three atmospheres of water, which means you can't just leave. It's, uh, you're, you're on saturation, and so it's a very good analog for spaceflight. I don't know if Simon showed you this picture, but these are the three missions that Axiom has conducted, and I want you to pay attention to how many different flags you see here. In these three missions, we've taken people from eight different countries to the ISS. Now, the International Space Station is a partnership of five agencies around the world. NASA, the Russians, Europeans, Canadians, and Japanese. In those five agencies are 15 countries because ESA represents 11 of those uh, 15. And until recently, if you were not a citizen of one of those countries, you could not have a mission to the ISS. So one of Axiom's goals is to expand access for more and more countries, more and more individuals, more and more researchers to have access to space, either by going there or by having their research fly or their experiments or their manufacturing or technology, whatever it may be. Um, I guess I should introduce the crew of AX1. Larry Connor is an American, I'm gonna say businessman three times because all three of these gentlemen were businessmen. They self-funded, so they went for themselves, but they didn't go to be tourists, they went to do research. So each of them had a, an alliance with one or more research partners. In Larry's case, it was with the Mayo Clinic and the Cleveland Clinic, which are two very important hospitals in the US. Below Larry is Mark Pathy, he's a Canadian from Montreal. Uh, he teamed up with the Montreal Children's Hospital and the Royal Canadian Geographical Society. And to his right, your left, is Eitan Stibe from Israel. He was a military pilot, but then he became a businessman, quite successful. And his uh, predecessor, the only other Israeli to fly to space, was tragically killed in the Columbia accident in 2003. His name was Elon Ramon. And in Israel, they uh, created a foundation in the name of Elon, and Eitan went to the Ramon Foundation and said, help me put together a science program and an education program. And so the Ramon Foundation did a call for experiments and a call for outreach events all over Israel, and it was very, very successful. Briefly, AX2, Dr. Peggy Whitson was the commander. She's also a very experienced uh, NASA astronaut. 
John Schaffner is another American, also um, an individual who self-funded. And then the other two are Saudi astronauts, the first Saudi female and the second and third Saudis to ever go to space. They, of course, took a lot of research from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And then finally, AX3, to the right is Walter Villade. Walter is a very experienced uh, cosmonaut trainee. He spent a lot of time in Svyoznigarodok uh, near Moscow, um, training to be a cosmonaut to fly in the Soyuz. And finally, his dream came true when he flew with, with us. Uh, below him is Marcus Wandt. He's a Swedish, also a fighter pilot. Turns out he, is an, he was selected by ESA as an alternate astronaut. And so he flew both with the Swedish flag, but also under the auspices of ESA. And of course, his research came both from Sweden and from the European Space Agency. And finally, Alper Gerizalci, who was the very first Turkish human being to fly to space. Also turns out a fighter pilot, but also an airline pilot, interestingly. So let's talk a little bit about training. So these people, we, we don't know each other ahead of time. I had met uh, Alper before because I was involved in his selection. And I had seen Walter in Star City. But the rest of us are complete strangers to each other. And definitely, in the first case, we, with the private individuals, we didn't know each other. And so the first thing we do is get to know each other, and we do it in a, a very severe environment. And the idea is to make you feel very uncomfortable physiologically. And the point is basically to bond with each other through suffering. So you're in a lousy situation. It's, in our case, it was cold and wet. We were in the mountains of Alaska. And we spent a week there basically surviving. We weren't dying of, uh, of starvation because we brought our supplies with us. But nonetheless, we're in tents. And let me tell you, these are people who fly around in private jets. So this is a hardship for them. But let me tell you that we really became a, a very solid crew because of this experience. On the other hand, the AX3 crew had it easy. We basically. We basically had a vacation. Why? Because the weather was beautiful. In the Pacific Northwest, it can be very wet and very rainy. It turned out to be nice and sunny for the entire time we were there. So we had a, a really good experience. And we still got to bond together as a crew. So many of these uh, folks, especially the private astronauts, had never felt what it's like to be weightless. Raise your hand if you've been in a swimming pool everybody. So you know what it feels like to be weightless. The difference here is that you don't have to come up for air when you're, weight, when you're weightless. You're floating in, uh, in air. Now, the only way to do that for a very long time or for any time at all, really, a couple of ways. You can jump off a very tall diving board and for a little while while you're heading toward the water, you'll be weightless. You can get in an airplane like this where you do a parabolic flight trajectory and you'll be weightless for about 20 or 25 seconds. You can now fly in a suborbital uh, mission, either with Virgin Galactic, an American company, or Blue Origin, another one, where you get about three to four minutes of zero gravity time. Uh, or you can go to space, where gravity apparently, when I say apparently, I mean we don't feel it. There's a lot of gravity where we are, but we're going pretty fast, so we're always in free fall around the planet. So we go from mini gravity to macro gravity here. This is a centrifuge where we can um, withstand the g-forces that we would experience during both the launch and the landing and also in an escape scenario. Escape scenario is during ascent, something goes wrong, wrong with one of the engines, the vehicle figures out you don't have enough oomph to get to space, and so the capsule will separate itself and it does so very aggressively with a lot of Gs, and we feel what that feels like in this training. So the next thing we do is train on the vehicles that we're going to spend time in. We spend time on the, in the transit vehicle, which is the Dragon capsule. It takes us from Earth to the space station. We spend time on the space station, get back in the Dragon capsule, and come back to Earth. The time in the Dragon varies a little bit. It can go anywhere from several hours to, in our case, it took 36 hours to get to the ISS, and it took 47 hours to come home. So we have to really know how to live and work on the, in the Dragon capsule, but more importantly, we have to know what to do in case of, of a problem. So there's all kinds of systems failures that could happen, and we know we have procedures that help us work through that, but the most important thing is, what do you do in case of a fire? 
What do you do in case of a rapid depressurization? Same thing on ISS. We spent on AX1, we spent 15 days on ISS. On AX2, sorry, three, we spent 18 days on ISS. So all the time that we're spending on here, of course we're doing work, we're doing, we're living, we're eating, we're sleeping, we're breathing, we're drinking, we're going to the bathroom, all those things. Um, but we're always in the back of our mind, what do we do when there's a problem? Where's the fire extinguisher? Where's the breathing mask? And we do that through a lot of repetition in a lot of different uh, simulators and mock-ups. A few other photos here, we learn how to take pictures um, with different kinds of cameras. You can see Mark on the upper left with a breathing mask. Um, actually, he's pretending to be breathing on the breathing mask because he has another mask. It was during the pandemic, unfortunately. We get some medical training in case something happens. We can't just go to the emergency room. We have to uh, learn how to treat each other. So we all get some pretty fundamental medical training. Uh, we, we go into an altitude chamber where they quickly depressurize the chamber to make it feel like you're in a rapid depressurization. You have to quickly put on a mask. You recognize your symptoms of hypoxia so you can react quickly and know what to do. And then, of course, we spend time in simulators. This is a Crew Dragon cockpit. Uh, it's very modern. It's very um, uh, advanced, very intuitive. It's got beautiful displays. But you still have to know how to interact with them. And you know, going from a cockpit that has switches and sticks, it has a touch screen, which is a very different thing to learn. So it's, it's a big learning experience. But all of these things happen either at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, that's for the ISS, or at uh, SpaceX training, which is out in near Los Angeles in California. So this process took about eight months. Um, it was pretty rushed. The other thing that I don't have any images of is we trained a lot on these experiments that I was mentioning. So we, we learn how to talk to the science team to understand what the machinery or what the equipment does, how to use it. We took a lot of blood samples, so we practiced both giving and taking blood. Uh, it was a, a lot of interesting work. Most of the science, I would say, was biological, so we, we learn a lot about the human body. We deal with a lot of uh, microscopy, with a lot of, as I said, blood and urine samples, et cetera. And then when we're almost ready to fly, we go to Florida and we see our capsule. This is the one we are actually gonna fly in. The capsules are reusable. Um, there are four of them that SpaceX has, has uh, built. I've flown on two of them. One on AX1 was Endeavor and this one is Freedom. Uh, this metal covering is just protecting the solar arrays. So when we're in space, we generate electricity by pointing that part of the spacecraft at the sun. And on the other side, there's radiators which reject the heat and we get to put, in, put on our uh, space suits, not the ones we train in, but the ones that we'll actually fly in. We climb inside the vehicle. We ask the, the ground technicians where we would like to have some devices, maybe some Velcro to hold our, our water bottles or our checklists or something like that. This is the AX-1 crew. You can see this capsule in the, behind the scaffolding there. And then this is the AX-3 crew with, uh, in front of our capsule there. And then we go into quarantine. We go into quarantine to protect the ISS environment. So we don't want to be taking any viruses or, or bugs, any bacteria with us. So we spend about two weeks there. And the reason two weeks is that's about the, the gestation period for something. If you catch something by the time two weeks have passed, you'll pretty much be over it and you can fly to space. Uh, that's been very successful. We've rarely had anything be transmitted from the ground to the space station crew. And it's a good thing, right? Because space station is a closed environment. Again, we have a pretty complete medical suite if we need it. We have the ability to access um, specialists on the ground to consult with them about treatment, but we'd rather not get sick. And then finally, L minus two, L meaning launch day, minus two, we have a dress rehearsal. So we do the exact same procedures and steps at the same time as we will on launch day, meaning we get up at a certain time, we go to the suit up facility in a helicopter, we put the suits on, we get out of the building and we go to the launch pad, 
We go up the elevator to the access arm. We get in the capsule with the help of the technicians. The technicians close the hatch. They perform a leak check. We go through all the switches in the cockpit, get ready to fly. When the countdown clock gets to zero, nothing happens. Two days later, however, it's a very different story. So this is us uh, just before entering the capsule on AX3. And now the, close, the hatch is closed, the leak check is complete, the countdown clock becomes the center of everybody's focus because we know when it gets to zero, something's gonna happen this time. There's not a lot for us to do. Uh, I would say that we have a, some light chatter. We sometimes may take a nap. Uh, we're thinking a lot about what's gonna happen on ascent. Um, but mostly you're getting more and more excited. As the digits go from four digits to three to two to one, uh, it gets very exciting. So the launch is um, the engines, nine Merlin engines light a few seconds before launch. They all get checked to make sure they're okay. If they're not, everything shuts down and we try again another day. But when they do light, it's a fairly gradual liftoff off the launch pad. Um, the acceleration is basically the ratio of the thrust of the vehicle to its weight. The thrust stays about constant, the weight decreases as we consume propellant. So the, the Gs are constantly increasing. When the first stage is spent, the Gs go to zero for just a second, and then the second stage lights. Very weak, the second stage you know, is just a little bit more than uh, one G, but it gradually builds up again as we build propellant. And it goes all the way up to about four and a half Gs, which is a fair amount. It's like somebody that weighs four and a half times as much as you sitting on your chest. So you have to think about how to breathe, et cetera. But the whole thing only lasts about eight and a half to nine minutes. And then we're in space. We're traveling at eight kilometers per second velocity. Uh, if you've ever seen a rocket launch, it looks like the rocket goes up vertically, but it, it only goes up vertically long enough to get out of the atmosphere. And then it goes horizontal. And the reason it goes horizontal is to keep getting that speed. So it's like you're in a Tesla or the fastest electric car you can imagine, and the acceleration is just brutal. It just keeps going and going and going. And you really, really feel the sensation of speed until the second stage engine stops, and all of a sudden you're in weightlessness. It's beautiful, peaceful. We get a chance to look out the window, climb out of our seats. It's magnificent. As I mentioned, in our case, it took uh, 36 hours to get to the space station. This is us, you know, on final approach. You can see the nose cone is open. This is the docking adapter that you see at the very front of the, of the capsule. And then this is us now docked. You see the nose cone again, and now we're attached. So there's a hatch on our side of the vehicle, and there's obviously a hatch on the ISS side. That space um, is at vacuum, obviously, and we watch it for a while to make sure the pressure isn't getting bigger. If it's getting bigger, it's coming from one of the two vehicles, that's bad. But after the certain amount of time, everybody's convinced, we open the two hatches, and we get a glimpse of each other for the first time. So there's seven people living aboard the ISS routinely, I would say. Usually it's a, quite a mix of international crews. On this uh, last mission, we had three Russians, two Americans, one Japanese, one Dane, and then the four of us as well. Um, on this crew, on the AX-1 crew, which you see here, we had a, a little more Americans, uh, let no Japanese and, and no Danes, but uh, a German instead. So as you can see, it's always a mixed company. So we hug each other, we say hello, we get a safety briefing. Here's what you're gonna do in case of a fire. This is where we keep the fire extinguishers, where we keep the breathing masks, etc. And then we go to work. It looks fine on this monitor, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> you can maybe just focus on the first few lines at the top. Basically, each line represents a crew member. And across the top is the time. So you can see GMT, we go around the Earth about every 90 minutes. So we can't very well uh, wake up with the sun and go to sleep when it goes down. So we use an art uh, artificial time, which is, as I said, Greenwich Mean Time or UTC. As you can see, we wake up at six, those of you that can read the very top. The next line is Houston time. The next line under that is day-night cycles. So you can see there's a little bit more day than night. And the reason that is, is as you, if you can imagine the, Earth, the spacecraft is going around the Earth, it's only in nighttime when you're actually in the shadow of the Earth. 
Otherwise, you're in a partial illumination. The lines under that, the sort of orange one and the green one, tell us when we have two different kinds of communication available to us. And then we have the bands for each of the crew members. So we wake up, we have post-sleep, so that's hygiene, go to the bathroom, maybe get a little breakfast. And then the blue boxed one, which says DPC, you'll see one there, and you'll also see one here at 1900. DPC stands for Daily Planning Conference. The daily pa it's fixed, just as I was changing the slide. The Daily Planning Conference is when we have a conversation with all of the sites here that represent those agencies I was, rem I was mentioning. So Houston, Munich, Japan, and Moscow, in that order. And then after that, to go back, hopefully it'll, well, of course. <laughs> then we have the workday. And the workday um, is from, as you see, from about 7.30 to about 1900, so about 12 hours. We have an hour for lunch in the middle. And each of these blocks represents an activity, usually a science experiment, sometimes an outreach event, et cetera. So this is what drives our day from the time we wake up to the time we go to sleep. And I, I will say that on a long duration mission, so the, I, the permanent resident ISS crew does this Monday through Friday. And on Saturday, they, they spend the morning doing housekeeping, and then the afternoon is free, and all day Sunday is free. But the long duration crew members have to exercise every day. The reason we exercise is that being in space is delightful. It's effortless, it's super pleasant, tranquil. It's like being in that pool when you're floating. Very easy to move around. The problem is your muscles are getting wasted and especially your, your skeletal system. So all of you sitting here are holding up the weights of your heads, which is not nothing, and that's putting some pressure on your spine and that stimulates continued bone growth. In the absence of that, your, your body starts to lose calcium and therefore lose um, bone density, which is bad. So they have to exercise for two and a half hours every day. Half of that is uh, cardiovascular. We have a treadmill. Of course, we have to wear a harness when we're on the treadmill or else we would just go flying off into space, but we can adjust the tension to make it harder or easier to run. And we have a, an ergometer, a bicycle, where we use sort of racing pedals that have clips and we, and we get pretty good at staying in one place. And the other half is um, resistive exercise. So anybody paying attention will say, how can you lift weights when there's no weight in space? Well, it's not really weight. We simulate the weight by uh, evacuating a cylinder, and you can graduate that to really mimic the same as a universal machine, universal weight machine on Earth. So it's very effective. So, <clears throat> Just to give you an idea, the inside of the space station, this is a complicated picture of three, a montage of three pictures taken from the same spot where you're looking forward, port, aft, or starboard. And you can see how complicated the inside of the space station is. A couple images just to show you the uh, type of work we're doing. You see Larry here in the lower left-hand corner is in what we call a glove box. So he's dealing with something that's either dangerous to us or we're dangerous to it. So we want to stay isolated from it. And so you put your arms in these gloves and, and we manipulate whatever the thing is. In this case, he's actually adding solution to stem cells to see how they react. Um, up here in the upper right-hand corner, Eitan is taking a uh, polymer and putting it in a, in a circular frame. And the more liquid he puts in it, the fatter and fatter it gets. If you put a lot of it, it would end up being a sphere, but he does it, he stops short of that, and then they cure it and under, under ultraviolet light, and it becomes hard, and it's now a lens. So they're practicing how we could maybe make lenses in space if we need to. This is a plant experiment that Alper did <clears throat> where he's measuring the growth using different media with a bunch of different Petri dishes. Uh, this is Marcus's head up here wearing a, a skull cap with a lot of electrodes. We were doing some uh, brain activity measurements. This suit that Walter is wearing is uh, very fashionable, but also a very um, functional. It's got a lot of body sensors, so think of a Fitbit or an Apple Watch on steroids. It can measure a lot of different things. 
You see Marcus here is uh, accessing a toolbox that we have, so we have a ton of tools in case we have to do any repairs or just routine maintenance. And there's Alper with that plant experiment that I mentioned. So it's not all work. Um, before the DPC in the morning and after the DPC in the evening, we have time for a meal in addition to lunch. Meals are very important. This is Alper and I at our uh, table in the service mo in the node. And as you can see, our um, utensil of choice is a spoon. This is a typical form of food. It's just in a foil pouch, <clears throat> complete with its sauce or liquid or whatever. We just put it in an oven to get it warm, cut it open with some scissors, and usually we use a spoon to eat it. You see the other spoons of the other crew members are sort of waiting there in standby. And it's pretty easy. We have some tape that we put, double-sided tape, on the top of the table. And you just plop your spoon there, and it stays there until you come back. Luckily, we have our initials on the spoon, so we don't get confused. Alper is holding a drink bag. <clears throat> drink bag can be empty. You just put water in it, or it can have some powder. You make coffee that way. We make juice drinks that way. So uh, more importantly than the food, though, is the, the camaraderie around mealtime, especially um, on my fourth mission, which was to the ISS, seven months long, only three people. We really enjoyed the time together. The station wasn't very big back then, but with only three people, we could sometimes go the entire day and not see each other. So it's really nice to be able to compare notes and talk about things happening on the ground and um, really have a moment to socialize. We also have fun with liquids, of course. Um, you can see both Marcus and Eitan have released a bubble of water and are playing with it. Eitan actually put a ping pong ball inside the water to see what would happen. <coughs> there you see he's doing his best uh, yoga imitation, maybe Dalai Lama imitation, I'm not sure. I'm actually playing a keyboard. Um, I don't play a keyboard very well on Earth, and it's even worse in space. Because when you press on the keys, your body goes that way. So you really have to strap yourself in and hold yourself tight with your feet to be able to play. Probably the, the most enjoyable activity, activity is uh, taking images from the cupola. Um, this is a, a, a semi-module that looks down toward the Earth all the time. The space station flies like an airplane. So as we go around the Earth, the, the belly of the station is always facing nadir or the Earth. So we can take some great pictures either out that center circular window or out the sides where we can see the limb. Seeing the Earth is like nothing you can imagine. I had seen many, many pictures of the Earth from space before I flew for the first time. I had been told by my uh, senior astronaut colleagues how amazing it would be, and it still takes your breath away, and it never gets old. You become pretty good at geography. It's easy to know where you are over the Earth if you can see a coastline. But even when you can't see a coastline, you can begin to detect that each continent has a little bit of a different color. Australia is a little bit on the reddish side. Uh, Africa is either brown or very green, depending on where you are. And of course, the cities are very noticeable, especially at night, when you can pick out the patterns of the city, <coughs> city lights. So we're getting toward the end of the day. Um, this is Ali, one of our Saudi crew members, going to sleep. Uh, this is how you sleep. It, it looks like he's on the wall, but it doesn't matter. It could be on the ceiling. It could be on the floor. We only sleep in the sleeping bag really because we just don't want to float around. We need to be stationary. You see we've got the holes cut in the side. And um, it's a little hard to fall asleep, generally because you don't feel I shouldn't say that. It's easy to fall asleep. It's hard to stay asleep because you don't feel like you're lying down. You know, that very gratifying fleeing, feeling where you have your head on a pillow. So some people will actually attach something to the back of their head to make them feel like they're on a pillow. Other people will use uh, some kind of a, a cord or a bungee to hold themselves against the wall to give themselves that pressure. So finally, it's uh, ready to come home. Um, here we are signing our mission patch, which um, we had affixed to the docking adapter, where we, as you can see, we were the fifth crew to ever dock on that do docking adapter, signed our name, got back in our suits, got back in our capsule, and here we are separating from, uh, from the ISS. So remember I said that uh, we're traveling at 8, 
thousand meters per second. It turns out in order to re-enter the atmosphere, you just have to slow down by about 100 meters per second. And we do that by pointing the thrusters, in this case in the front of the capsule, in the direction of travel, and we light the engines and that ends up being like a brake. So once that happens, then you're in free fall and you slowly begin to, to reduce your altitude. That difference of 100 meters per second is enough so that the low point of your orbit, it's no longer circular, it's now uh, closer to the surface of the Earth, and in fact, it's in the atmosphere. And of course, once you start hitting the resistance of the atmosphere, you slow down even faster, which makes you get in the deeper part of the atmosphere, which makes you slow down even faster. And so you end up taking out all the energy that those rocket engines put in during your ascent into heat to dissipate the energy as we come back toward Earth. We enter the Earth's atmosphere somewhere in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, and by the time we get uh, off the east coast of Florida, we're coming straight down in parachutes. The parachute opening sequence is pretty dynamic. There's uh, two sets of parachutes, a small drogue chutes, two of them come out, and then after a while they stabilize and they pull four larger parachutes out. They come out by the last um, thousand meters, everything is stable, you're in 1G again, and you see the countdown, of course we have altitude uh, indicated on our instruments, and we go 807, or 8, 6, 4, 2, 1. Splashdown is actually pretty soft, I was a little surprised. Um, very quickly the recovery forces, as you can see, they're waiting for us, even before we get there, so that gives you an idea of the uh, accuracy of the navigation. And then finally you can see how charred the capsule is because of all that heat that was generated. So what I would like to do now is show a video that kind of tells the story, in this case of AX1, very briefly. And then I'll get to the second. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, Ignition. Stop. Go Falcon. Go Dragon. Got speed. Axiom one. key mission objectives for AX-1 have always been scientific research and outreach, performing meaningful science while still taking the time to communicate out the impact and application of that research. This is really uh, the opening of a new era, where it's not just government astronauts like it's been for the last 60 years. When you start to dig into it, microgravity is a very unique environment to conduct research and uh, experiments. Just the whole experience looking out of the cupola is beautiful, amazing. אנחנו עפים מעל כדור הארץ במהירות עצומה וכל 45 דקות יש או זריחה או שקיעה ורואים כדור מדהים. It's been an amazing experience. This will be something that we can share with humanity. After 17 total days in space, 15 of them aboard the ISS, we are in the final phase of a journey that has covered more than 240 orbits and 6.3 million miles. There's our first view of Dragon Endeavor re-entering the Earth's atmosphere with the Axiom-1 crew. We can confirm that the Dragon capsule has splashed down. To the crew of AX-1, well done. Okay, since you're all self-proclaimed space nerds, what I uh, thought I might do is take advantage of the experience that I've had um, f flying on three different vehicles six different times to kind of look at the differences between the three uh, generations of spacecraft. So just a quick resume, this is my uh, first mission, STS-73, which is a microgravity science mission in 1995. The second one was STS-92 on Space Shuttle Discovery. It was a f one of the very first ISS assembly missions uh, in, in uh, 2000. The third mission was also on the Space Shuttle. This one was Endeavour, uh, another Space Shuttle, I mean Space Station assembly mission that was in 2002. And then finally, the Soyuz, which I haven't talked too much about, but that was a seven-month mission, Soyuz to the ISS and back. Uh, we launched in April of 2006, and, and sorry, in September 2006, and landed in April of 2007. 
And then, of course, the two Axiom missions uh, with the crews of AX-1 in 2022 and AX-3 in 2024. So with all that, I want to make some comparisons about the, th the three different experiences. So the first I want to talk about is the suits. So it, we're going to do it not in my chronological order, but in the order of, let's say, the generation of spacecraft. So the first one, the oldest one, is a Soyuz. It flew for the first time in 1967. And this is the launch and entry suit with the front of it unzipped. And what you're seeing here in my hands is the bladder layer. So it's the part that keeps the air in. That's an important part. And the way that they seal it is very ingenious. They basically take all this extra material like a big flap, and they literally take a rubber band and wind it around a few times, tuck it in, close it up, and you're done. Super brilliant. We do a uh, leak check before. This is what the, um, we call it the couch. I wish, uh, you're, you should be happy that couches are not like that at home. <laughs> um, but we do a leak check prior to launch to make sure everything is buttoned up. Um, I can tell you that in order to verify the suit, we have to spend three hours with that pressurized to a third of an atmosphere. One of the toughest uh, experiences in human space life for me. This is the shuttle launch and entry suit. You can see it's very bulky. Um, the purpose of all of these launch and entry suits is not to do a spacewalk. They're not um, rigid enough, nor are they maneuverable enough. I know that sounds a little paradoxical, but they're very different design. This is just to keep you safe in case you have to be, in case there's a depressurization in the capsule. So remember I said that's one of the big risks. Our response is to get in your spacesuit as soon as you can. Because once you're in your spacesuit, then you're probably going to be safe. Now it's just a question of does the vehicle have enough gas to support me in this pressurized spacesuit? Anyway, likewise, uh, we get pressure checked. Uh, this one has many pieces. It has gloves that are separate, boots that are separate, and the helmet that's separate from the suit itself. And then finally, the SpaceX suit, designed, no kidding, by a Hollywood movie maker. Um, and it, some people, you either love it or you hate it. I, I think the jury is still out. But it's, it's one piece. There's a, uh, a zipper that goes sort of from one ankle to the other. That's how you get in it. And then the, there's zippers in the, in the gloves to allow you to take your hand out to help you get oriented and get strapped in. And then you put your gloves back in. Uh, but you can see it's, uh, it's a more comfortable to stand up in. It's, uh, it's not a bad suit. So next, let's talk about the cockpit. The one word to describe the Soyuz cockpit is small. It's very small. Three people in there. Um, we, we joke about the training for this is to basically subject yourself to being in a very small environment as if you're claustrophobic. But you can see that from one end of the cockpit to the other, it's pretty tight. Um, the controls are pretty rudimentary. There's a, a sort of a matrix where you press a, a button corresponding to a letter and a, another button corresponding to a number, and that sends a command. So it's really an analog vehicle with a, a few layers of digitization over top of it. So a decade or so later, the technology in the space shuttle is very different. What you see here are just a lot of switches, uh, literally a thousand switches in the cockpit. So this is a very manual uh, machine. The docking is manual. The landing is manual. And all of the operations are very intensive with procedures and the crew. Finally, the Dragon is super clean. No buttons, hardly anything. This is the, uh, the front of the displays. These are the touch screens that you saw in previous images. And then just a handful of buttons across the bottom. So all the commands are sent through various displays, which I can't show you, but it's, uh, suffice it to say, it's very elegant, very user-friendly, very intuitive, and very well thought out. Okay, and let's, let's talk about the launch experience. So the Soyuz is a liquid-fueled rocket. Liquid is, uh, the fuel is kerosene. The oxidizer is liquid oxygen, which is cold. So when this is ready for launch, part of the green part will actually be white because there'll be ice on the outside. The way it works is when the engines light, they come up very gradually and thrust, and the, and the uh, spacecraft is actually just sitting on the launch pad. And when the thrust gets strong enough, it will lift itself up. Uh, I'll talk about other ideas later. So we put this um, 
suit on, and as you can see, it's not quite so comfortable to stand up in because it's made to be in that couch, in that uh, supine position. But we have a little bit of a ceremony. We walk out. There's a little bit of a crowd, but there's mostly the authorities. We have to report to say we're ready to fly. And then we go out to the launch pad. What's different here <clears throat> is that there's all kinds of people on the launch pad. Kennedy Space Center, there's literally seven people within three miles of the rocket. They're all wearing this very special gear. Here we have a guy wearing his you know, track suit taking pictures on the side. Uh, but the launch itself is very smooth. It's liquid, so it just feels like it's acceleration in one direction. Uh, there's three stages. The first stage is basically a, a middle uh, section with four engines on it, plus four separate sections with four engines each. When the first stage is over, those four sections are jettisoned. You continue with the center section. When it's empty, that part is jettisoned, and then there's a, there's a third stage. And of course, in each of these things, the acceleration increases, then it decreases when the stage is over, then it increases again, and so you get sort of a sawtooth <coughs> profile. This is an amazing machine. Um, part rocket, part laboratory, part airplane, actually not airplane glider, because it has no engines when it comes back. But it has several parts. The airplane looking part, we call it the orbiter. There were five of them. Um, the external tank, which is the brown cone shaped thing in the middle, fuels the three engines which are here on the bottom of the, of the orbiter itself. So the fuel here is liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. Very clean, but hydrogen is a very small molecule, meaning it, it gives itself to leaking quite a bit. So it's complicated. <clears throat> and then the two white things on either side are filled with solid propellant. It feels like the consistency of a pencil eraser, and it's about the same color, sort of that pink color. But when those rockets um, burn, they're very rough. So as opposed to the liquid fuel, which is very smooth and, and very constant, this is, there's a lot of vibration. So we feel that in first stage quite a bit. Similarly, we walk out, we get transported to the uh, launch pad in a, in a transport vehicle. <clears throat> At liftoff, the three main engines light before you go anywhere, but the, the shuttle is basically bolted down to the launch pad. Each of those solid rocket boosters has four big bolts that hold it down, and those bolts <clears throat> don't explode until T minus zero seconds. So at 6.6 .6 seconds, the first of the three engines lights, then the second, then the third. They all come up to full power, and they check each other, make sure everything's good. And only at T0 do you get the explosive, the nuts on those bolts fall, and then the solid rocket boosters ignite. And the thrust from the boosters is very strong. So the three engines together <clears throat> produce about a million pounds of thrust, whereas the two solid rocket boosters produce about three million each. So the majority of the thrust comes from that, and you can really feel it. A lot of vibration. We do a big roll maneuver as we uh, leave the launch pad. And for the first two minutes, you're under that heavy vibration. Then the solid rocket boosters are spent, and they fall off. And then the external tank fueling the three main engines continue for the rest of the six and a half minutes or so to get to space. Finally, SpaceX is um, also liquid fueled. It's uh, also kerosene, a little bit like the Soyuz and liquid oxygen. Two stages, the first stage has nine engines. Those nine engines, again, light before you ever lift off. Um, but the, so again, the thrust is a, is a little bit more gradual than certainly on the space shuttle. We also have a little uh, ceremony where we walk out, but there's nobody around, it's just a photographer. Uh, we get into, not surprisingly, Teslas when we drive to the launch pad. Um, but again, the launch is quite similar to the Soyuz in terms of the acceleration profile. In fact, this is the acceleration profile. If you're a really space nerd, you'll appreciate this. The, uh, the units on the left are mislabeled. It should be meters per second squared. But if you divide by 10, that's basically Gs. Now, keep in mind that the Gs, you're, you're lying on your back, and the vehicle's going that way. So the Gs you feel are this way, which are pretty tolerable. It just feels like I said somebody twice or three times or four and a half times your weight is sitting on your chest. Um, as opposed to airplane Gs, which are usually this way, which is troublesome because it makes the blood sort of leave your head, 
and then you start losing your color vision, then your, all of your vision, and then consciousness, and nobody likes that. But you can see the, this little um, dip here at about um, 40 seconds is called a throttle bucket. The reason that we do that is that's when the vehicle goes through transonic region and the, the area of what they call maximum dynamic pressure. So the, between the thickness of the air and the speed that you're going, the dynamic pressure is a square of the velocity. So it can be very violent. So we actually throttle the engines back a little bit to get through that phase, and then we throttle them back up. And then the sawtooth that you see toward the end of first stage is just to keep the vehicle from exceeding its limitations, which is about 3.3 Gs. Then you see a rapid decrease to zero. The second engine lights actually less than a G at the beginning, but then it picks up. And you can see, again, it throttles itself at about four and a half Gs, and now you're in space. So finally, landing. Landing in a Soyuz, um, I describe it as a series of explosions followed by a car crash. <laughs> so the series of explosions are the shoot, parachute opening sequence. It's very similar to the SpaceX <clears throat> system, except it, it has a, a drogue chute, but it only has one main parachute. But the difference is there's a lot of motion. When the drogue chute comes out, the capsule starts swaying back and forth. And when you've been in space for seven months, that's not very pleasant. Then it comes release, and then the big parachute comes out. And the other big difference is we land in the dirt. This is in the Kazakh steppe. So here you see us just before touchdown. You can see the shadow. There's nothing wrong here. That's not a, um, it is an explosion, but it's supposed to happen. There are actually little solid rocket motors that ignite when we're just one meter above the ground. So it's to make a so-called soft landing. And then, of course, you can see the not-so-soft landing here at the end. <laughs> so this is a majestic um, glider. We enter in the space shuttle the atmosphere about 7,000 kilometers from the runway. <clears throat> and then, as I said, we're still going almost orbital speed, maybe 100 um, meters per second slower. And then the vehicle measures the energy that it has based on its speed and its altitude and the distance that it has to go to get to the landing site. And it's constantly calculating, what, what should I do? If I need um, to get rid of more energy, I can roll more. In fact, I can even go inverted and dig into the thick part of the atmosphere until such time that I'm back on the energy curve. Then I'll roll and maintain a normal back and forth S-turn sensation. Um, the vehicle does that itself, but we actually have instrumentation that we can do some calculations very quickly and very poorly, I might add. Nothing, nowhere near as good as the computers do it if they should fail. Finally, we get to um, subsonic speeds just over the, the runway, and then the commander takes over and manually flies like a glider all the way to touchdown. Touchdown is like a, like a good landing in a commercial airplane. Very smooth, very nice. And I talked a little bit about the um, SpaceX entry. You saw the chute opening sequence in the video. Um, what I didn't show you, though, is you can see that the, uh, the rescue forces are on us very quickly. Uh, this is us bobbing around in the water. You can see all the stains on the, uh, on the capsule from the entry. This is an overhead view of the SpaceX recovery vessel, one of two. Um, obviously, it's got a helicopter deck in the middle, but if you look to the right, there's another circular form there, and that's where they pick the dragon up and they set it down. They call that the dragon's nest. And here you see the dragon actually sitting on the dragon's nest just before they pull it forward, and then this is the hatch that we open up. So. Little past, present, and future with the three uh, kinds of vehicles, comparisons of the suits, the cockpit, the launch, and the landing. And I will be happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you. Дошли отново, отново напомням, задавайте вашите въпроси, макар че има твърде много, не знам дали ще се впишем в времето, за да задам всички. Майкъл, благодаря 
very much, first of all, for being our guests and for your, uh, for your presentation. Uh, I would like to point out in the beginning that you are 66 years old. Yes. And that's impressive. And you're going to fly in space real soon. We'll see. We'll see. I flew at 65, so... Yeah, well, you look great. Is it <clears throat> microgravity or something that is doing this? No, it's my mother and my father. <laughs> oh, it's <laughs> genetics. Yeah. It's, it's not certainly not my lifestyle, unfortunately. <laughs> oh, it, I, I thought it's something in the space food or in the training routine on the space station. This is not brand placement, by the way. It's, I'm going to turn it this way. Yeah, he actually likes that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Um, in order to kick the conversation off, uh, let's start with the beginnings. Were you the type of child that actually dreamed about space? And, or, or is it something that actually happened to you? Did you have this planned out? Or yeah, I, how did it I, all I start? I have to say yes and no. So first of all, it's a very common for NASA astronauts to know that they wanted to be an astronaut since the moment they were born or even the moment they were conceived sometimes. <laughs> Um, it, it's it just that type of people. It didn't right? happen for me. I, it was 11 years old because that's when we landed on the moon. And uh, that really moved, moved me. And also, <clears throat> I started, my, my mother happened to work at NASA in an educational office. And so she was bringing home some uh, material, reading material. So I really fell in love with the idea. And my best friend and I, you know, mocked up the inside of my closet to look like a spacecraft and all that. So that was 11 years old, and that probably lasted, I don't know, three or four years. Um, I, I definitely did not have that dream when I decided to go to university at the Naval Academy. Um, when I went to Naval Academy, I thought I wanted to be a submariner. And I spent three days on a submarine, and I decided it wasn't for me. <laughs> so I, I decided to become an aviator. And I, st I studied, uh, academically, I studied engineering. And so I wanted to combine aviation and engineering that's what test pilots do. I started looking into becoming a test pilot. Turns out the US Naval Test Pilot School had basically all my childhood heroes had been graduates from there. So that's when the, born, the dream was born a second time. And I set my sights on doing that. I, went, I got a graduate degree. I went to test pilot school. These are sort of check boxes mm -hmm. um, on the way. And so it kind of, ha I mean, you have to have a lot of luck, let's be clear, but you can also set your your sights on something and keep trying. I mean, there is an application process, like yes. a formal bureaucratic process of yes. applying to being Today to it's all online. How did it feel when you get the application approved? Oh, some, that day changes your life. I mean, yeah. for, uh, I think Simon told you that the first time they didn't approve it, um, and that's quite disappointing, also not unexpected, but it's a, Interesting story, so the astronaut selection board is usually 12 people, eight astronauts and three or four uh, managers, let's say. And the chair of the board calls all the people that are selected, and all the people who are not selected um, are called by the executive director. And so what's a cruel joke is the executive director calls you, and you hear his voice. And you know. And you know, but in some cases they say, the chair would like to speak to you, and then they uh -huh. <laughs> hand you the phone. It's a cruel joke. Yeah. Did you? Do they actually give any feedback on why you were not selected? No. Nope. That's it. They send you a they literally you hanging. a three by five inch index card. Say sorry. Try again next time. Basically. Right. Yeah. Right. Now, if you have a medical issue, they'll tell you. If you're disqualified medically, they'll tell you. Right. Uh, now, obviously, astronauts are like all of us. They're different people. But what is what is something common about them? I mean, what is the main, let, let's put it this way, what, what is the main prerequisite? Yeah, I would say two things. Uh, the first thing is we like well-rounded people. So if you're a super duper researcher in this very narrow field that nobody's ever heard of, it's probably not the right person. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're that researcher and you're a scuba diver and a private pilot and a, a parachuter, that's different, right? So we, mm -hmm. we like people who have um, different kinds of experiences, especially if they're what we would call operational experiences, right? Where you have to make decisions and, and be you know, responsible for your safety. And the second thing is uh, be a team player. Space is a team sport, and we really focus heavily, uh, especially in our literally one hour interview, we try to get a sense from that person uh, you know, do I want to fly in space with that person? That's really important. 
So it's not really about formal education or physical abilities necessarily. It's more about the type of personality that one has. I, I would say that by the time you, know, you start with however many thousand people and you get to about 100 that go get, make it as far as the interview. Yep. And by the time you get to the 100, everybody's qualified from an educational, professional standpoint. Anybody could do the job. Now it's those fine selections between what, do I want to fly in space? And of course, the medical piece comes in too. Probably yep. a third of the people out of those 100 are disqualified medically. So, yeah. and the rest of it is how you do in that one hour interview. Now, being in the company of, uh, I would allow myself to say, exceptional human beings, did you ever feel out of place? Did you feel this imposter syndrome that most of the people have? Or? Yes, definitely. You know, when, when uh, we get to NASA, we do a year uh, as an astronaut candidate where you're really not in the astronaut office yet. You're learning um, and kind of being evaluated. You're on probation a little bit. Once you get past that stage, then we take a technical assignment while we're waiting for our turn to be assigned to a mission. And those technical assignments often are representing the astronaut office in some technical discussion about the main engines or the external tank or the boosters or some you know, thing. And you very quickly realize that you are far from the smartest person in the room. In mm. fact, generally, you're the least smart person in the room. And it's a very humbling experience. But since it's us whose you know, pink butt is on the line, uh, they very often look to us and say, you know, what do you think? So you really have to be um, diligent about being prepared. Yeah. Uh, all right. Let's, let's get to the, to the questions now. Uh, there are two questions, actually, that I'm, 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 I'm going to directly ask. What was your scariest experience in space? And what was the most profound thing that you saw in space? The profound thing is easy. It's the view of the Earth. I and mean, it never gets old. It's, it's always there. I, I would say seeing the Earth from the vantage point of doing a spacewalk is even magnified. You just can't imagine. It's surreal is the best way I can describe it. You know, you, ex you know what to expect because, as I said, you've seen the photos. You know, you've talked to people. But until you see it with your own eyes, it's really hard to digest what it's going to be like. I forgot which astronaut was that who said that we went to space to discover Earth. Yeah, that was Bill Enders, who just Bill recently Hanks. passed away. Yeah. He, yeah. he was uh, on the Apollo 8 mission that was the first to leave Earth orbit and go around the moon. And he said, we came all this way to look at the moon, and what we really discovered was Earth, or something like that. It was brilliant. And in terms of fear, so um, it's, it, it sounds interesting, but one thing that astronauts are terrified of is making a mistake, You're letting down the team, your crewmates, the people on the ground. And so the, the, the lowest moment I had was preparing for a spacewalk. It was the uh, third of three spacewalks that we did in pretty short succession. So my partner and I were in the airlock, in our suits, the airlock's being depressurized. In the meantime, outside, they're reconfiguring the station. There's a... Um, the space station has a very long me me metallic truss that holds a lot of the solar arrays and all that. And on the front of that truss is basically a railroad track. And there's a train that moves on a railroad track that can be positioned in different spots so that it, it's, uh, it allows you a work platform. It can bring tools with you. It can be a base for the robotic arm. So it's a pretty nifty idea. So they're repositioning this train on the track, and all of a sudden, it got stuck. And immediately, both of us, who had just been outside the day before, thought we probably left a tether or something out there, and it got fouled up in there. That was our first thought. It turns out it wasn't our fault, but those are 30 terrifying minutes when we were worried that we had done that. And it's funny how you don't worry about being hit by a micrometeorite. Right, yeah. <laughs> you worry about you know, making a mistake and letting down the team. Yeah, or for Christ's sake, getting, being detached from the space station, just flying out in outer space. Do you have a scenario for that? We do. We have a, a device. So, so back in the day when the shuttle was just the shuttle and they were flying um, missions to gather satellites and things like that, if you got detached, I'm not going to say it was no big deal, but the shuttle could maneuver and basically go drive and pick, pick you, you up. Pick you up. Huh. 
space station weighs 450 tons, you're, it's not going to move. Um, and so since then, of course, we're always tethered with a, a metal cable. Um, but the metal cable could break, unlikely, but possible. More likely, you make a mistake when you're attaching the end of it. It's a hook that attaches to a handrail or something. And if that should happen, now you're in trouble because you have no way to, um, to get yourself back. So we have a, a, a backpack-mounted device that is a, has a small tank with nitrogen gas. So it's cold gas. It's very simple. It has 24 thrusters, four in each direction. And so you deploy a hand controller. The first thing it does is it fires the thrusters to stop any rotation that you have. And then it's up to you to find the space station visually, because it could be behind you. So you generally yaw, because that takes the least energy until you see it. And then you start um, thrusting your way back. We practice this in virtual reality. And it's important to get there before you run out of fuel, <laughs> obviously, right. hmm. or battery which are both pretty critical because it's a very simple system. Uh, Avi, who is four years old, I don't know where Avi is, is asking, is space cold? Uh, yes. <laughs> now, it's a trick question because um, in the vacuum of space, there's nothing to measure the temperature. So we need air. But we can also measure the surface. So if you imagine the surface of the space station, it can change in temperature. When it's irradiated by the sun during the day, it's very hot, about 200 C. And at nighttime, it cools off to about minus 100 C quickly. So th it's just the radiative power of the sun that, that uh, warms it. But in the absence of that, space is cold. So did you get to feel these temperature changes? You can definitely changes, feel so. it you, you, in a couple of different ways. The black surfaces that when you're near them are hotter than the metallic surfaces that are reflective. And we do some work uh, during a spacewalk where our feet are anchored in a foot restraint, which is attached to the end of the robotic arm. So our crewmate is driving us around if we're carrying a big uh, object. And that boot plate that our feet are attached to is made of metal, and your feet get very cold <laughs> pretty fast. Right, right. Um, did you eat ice cream on the space station? <laughs> <laughs> That's also I a question did, but from it's a not, child. It's not the ice cream that uh, you may have tasted at the visitor centers in the, <laughs> at NASA. Uh, that's a brilliant invention, by the way. That tastes like it tastes like ice cream, but we don't have anything like that. We now have uh, the ability. We have freezers on the ISS, mostly for science, but almost every cargo resupply vehicle that comes up has some ice cream in it. Right. Have you lost anything in space? Did you just drop a tool that flew away? It happens all the time. All the time. Uh, I, have, I have not ever done that. Um, but it is, a, it is a big concern. Often it's one of these tether. So everything we touch, we have a, a, a tether. A tether can be like a, a small wire on a retractable uh, reel so that when you're moving it, it just it moves out. And then when you put it back, it comes back in. Um, and often when you're swapping these tethers around, that's when you make a mistake and it, and it comes loose. One of my um, crewmates during a spacewalk, this was not her fault, but we take a camera outside, a pretty nice big Nikon digital camera, and uh, one of somebody on the inside looked out the window and we could see the camera very <laughs> slowly. Turns out the thing that attaches the camera to the tool caddy, if you will, had failed, so it wasn't her fault. The tether was in place. Right. It just wasn't holding on to the camera anymore. So it becomes essentially a space junk that becomes that starts flying around yes. the orbit of and, the and, Earth. And a camera is something that can be tracked, and so they know when it re-entered. Any any object, even a space station, every once in a while at 400 kilometers altitude, there's enough um, atomic oxygen and some other particles that it does actually slow down over time and eventually it would decay and end up in the ocean. So uh, an object like a camera will definitely come down to Earth after several, probably days or weeks. Right, okay. Um, so in terms of experiments, now you, you did say that you don't go there for fun. You, everybody goes there for science or to do experiments or do, do some research. What are some of your favorite experiments? Uh, and are there any crazy ones that you can share? Let's see, uh, going back to my days on ISS um, as an expedition crew member, one that I would argue was a little crazy is um, when we sleep, 
at night, uh, as we're falling asleep, we sometimes see these white uh, flashes in our vision. And these are actually high energy particles that are going through our heads. So it's, we, we have a lot more radiation in space than we do here. And so there was an experiment designed to correlate how often we see these things to how often we're receiving. So we, I, we had to wear this great big thing on, on my head with a, a bunch of electrodes, and it was effectively a high energy particle detector. And I had a little push button, and every time I witnessed something, I pressed the button. And of course, they correlated it later. I didn't see nearly as many as we were receiving. The funny part, if you will, is that it's hard to keep your eyes open when it's dark in this thing for one entire right. orbit. So I'm pretty sure I fell asleep a couple of times. So, so, so these things, they, they travel in high velocity and they hit you all the time. Aren't these dangerous? I mean, it's, you... uh, it's, radiation is a risk and uh, it is known, you know, it, it has deleterious effects and NASA and the other agencies have a limit as to how much radiation they will allow you to receive in your career. Now, if you're a woman, it's tougher because they have more or organs that are more sensitive to those things, and especially if you're a young woman. So if you're a 66-year-old man, it's probably not a big deal. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, kids, ask the best questions. Uh, how do you decide which direction is up in the ISS? There is no up, but that's a great question because everything inside will indicates that there's an up and, a, and there's a down. So we have a lot of labels. All the labels have the same orientation. The, there are lights um, that are in the ceiling and not in the floor. And so you, they, whoever designed the space station arbitrarily decided which way it was gonna be up. By convention, we use up as our feet pointed to the Earth. And as I said, the space station flies like an airplane, so your feet are always pointed to the Earth when your head's up. But when you close your eyes, it makes zero difference. And a fun story, um, on my first mission was another um, science mission where we had a laboratory module in the very back of the shuttle's payload bay. And we had a, a tunnel that connected the, the laboratory to the, the, the crew compartment. And it was a long mission, and so the space shuttle didn't have uh, solar arrays. It used something called fuel cells to generate electricity. And the fuel cells used liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, which are consumable. Like, you, you only can take so much with you. So in order to save energy, we turned off the lights in that tunnel. So it was completely dark. So you would go into the tunnel, and you would pull yourself along very gently. But sometimes, you, unbeknownst to you, when you came out of the tunnel, you were now rolled maybe 180 degrees. And you thought you went in the wrong tunnel, because it looked nothing like what you expected just because you're upside down and the perspective is different. And all it takes is rotating yourself a little bit and all of a sudden the world snaps into place and you know exactly where you are. Mm. It's a wonderful feeling. I mean, I really, I, I almost try to make it happen to myself by going into, into different modules and different orientations, but it's a really delightful experience. Do you sleep well in this place? You sleep okay. Um, I think you need less, need less sleep. I was getting by with about five and a half hours. I, I like to have seven or more on Earth, so that's a pretty big difference. Mm. And I will say that on weekends, you make up for that just like you do on Earth. You know, you're tired by the time Saturday morning comes around, so you might stay in bed a bit later. But again, the sensation I was describing about not having your head on a pillow, you sort of miss that quite a bit. Yeah, bet. You sleep great when you come back. Uh, <laughs> now. Our, uh, our common friend Rex, who is also an astronaut, he, he told me that the scariest thing one can do in space, uh, well, besides obviously making a, a fatal mistake, you know, and, uh, and everything <laughs> else, is, fatal. is uh, because he also used to do EVAs, and he was mm -hmm. describing the following. You turn your back to the, space, to, the spa uh, to the space station, and the Earth is right behind you, and you turn off your lights, and you look into the vastness and darkness of space. And he said that very few people have actually done that. I love that. I mean, it's... Is, uh, uh, is, it, is it true? I mean, did you do that? Sure, you do that. Yeah, you, because you do it at nighttime, right? So there's still some glow from the Earth, the albedo. But if you're in, if you're in the shadow of the station from the Earth, if that makes sense, 
It's very dark outside, but it's beautiful. It's, um, I like to say that normally you look at the night sky and it looks like a black canvas with white dots and it's almost the inverse. There's so many stars, it's mind boggling. I didn't and, find and that scary at all, I found it beautiful. You didn't find it scary? No, no. Uh, is it true that you are in, especially when you are doing an EVA, that you are constantly feeling falling down? I mean, some people, I, I read like testaments from astronauts that describe the feeling as constantly falling towards Earth. When you're doing a spacewalk, I, I mean, I, I see that um, possibility. Let me say that when I did my first TVA, I did it from the space shuttle's airlock, and the space shuttle's airlock was in the payload bay, so it's sort of this U-shaped um, compartment. The payload bay doors are open and the space shuttle's airlock is at the bottom of that U. So when you come outside, you're, very, you're kind of protected on three sides. You don't see the Earth. People who do their first spacewalks from the space station airlock, the hatch opens looking straight down. And so you can wow. imagine that you hold on pretty tight for the first few <laughs> minutes when you're outside. Because you, I mean, the relative motion is very noticeable, as is the altitude. So it's, it's kind of wild. I don't know if any of you have seen um, this um, parachute from a very high altitude balloon by a guy named Felix Baumgartner oh, yes. several yeah. years ago. So at the time, and it may still be, it was the most watched of live events uh, streaming. So if you saw that, he had you know some cameras looking over his shoulder. That's exactly the perspective that you have. You know, I think they were wide angle cameras, so he was at however many, 127,000 feet, so you're not at 400 kilometers by any yeah. means, but that's the same thing. And when I saw that picture, I, I really like completely identified with it. It was something, so next, if you can find that video and you want to know what space looks like from the ISS, that's exactly the is same it, perspective. Is it, is it, you've been a test pilot, uh, which means that you were essentially testing untested machines, correct? Yeah, so is it scarier to, do space or... No, I or think it's, I think the piloting part is, is a little riskier. It's more challenging. It's, it's yeah. just that we have so many people looking at the risks so hard on, the, on a space mission, whereas, you know, you don't have the luxury of doing that with a, when you're testing yeah. a new airplane, for sure. Now, uh, obviously, we're in an age in which we're seeing a democratization of space. Uh, there you know, Axiom is, is, is part of this uh, great effort to actually provide the opportunity for many people to, to, to go to space. Uh, now, what are your thoughts about that and why do you think it's important that, that it's not only like Navy pilots uh, but also, or, or engineers, but also artists to go in space, for example? Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you a story that, uh, that really changed me. So, on my fourth mission, uh, I flew on the Soyuz spacecraft with a Russian cosmonaut, and the third person was a private citizen. So at the time, you could buy one seat on the Soyuz. You would go up with the one expedition crew and, and come home with the crew that they were relieving. So you spend, let's say, a week on the ISS. And I didn't really like that idea very much. I was, uh, you know, I was a test pilot. I, I thought this is a place only for professionals. The ISS was still under construction. Um, but that person, uh, who is a woman named Anusha Ansari, an Iranian-born American businesswoman, completely changed my opinion. So first of all, she was a great crewmate, did her job, no questions, pure professional. But more importantly, when we were in space, this is uh, September of 2006, she was blogging, brand new thing. And it dawned on me that look, the million of people who were following Anusha were paying attention to what was going on in space, and those million people would not care otherwise. Yeah. They wouldn't be paying attention. She was just relating the experience she was having. And this completely like, flipped a switch in my head that said, this isn't an experience that we, you know, hundreds of people in the history of humanity have had the opportunity to experience, should keep to ourselves, on the contrary, we should share it. Yeah. So when I left NASA, I went to Washington to work with an advocacy group, a trade association, on behalf of commercial space companies. So I went, I don't know if you have this uh, notion about drinking the Kool-Aid. Yeah. 
So I went from refusing the Kool-Aid to drinking the Kool-Aid to pouring the Kool-Aid. Yeah. And I was really, uh, and still am obviously a believer in this idea. I think we're getting away from the, uh, the term democratizing because it's still not very democratic, but yeah. let's say normalizing. Like it becomes more and more normal every day. And I think uh, that's a great path to yeah. be on. And I, and I still remember, was it, uh is this, th there is a difference of how lay people, if, well, in Shatner, for, for instance, is a lay person, uh, how they speak about space and how astronauts speak about space. I mean, I've, I've met only two astronauts, but you tend to be more uh, punctual, laconic, if you will, and they tend to be more expressive and more philosophical. The way that they articulate right. is, so, is quite different. Back yeah. to your question about uh, a, an artist in space, I 100% think that, in fact, the next Bulgarian in space might be a test pilot, but maybe it should be a teacher yeah. or a poet or a journalist or somebody who's a good storyteller. I think this is a, a great question yeah. for the people to decide. And I, you're right, engineers and test pilots make lousy storytellers. It's <laughs> just the way we are. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, can you imagine what Carl Sagan would have written if he had the opportunity right. to go into space? Yeah. It's important. Uh, interesting question, are astronauts superstitious? I mean, there are a bunch of questions about UFOs that I intentionally do not ask, but if you want, you can address them. Uh, but also this question about superstitions, I think it's important. And I don't know, religiosity, if you will, because we tend to think in more rigid categories about scientists and astronauts. Uh, I'm gonna leave the religious piece out because mm -hmm. I think that's very individual. I, there are definitely some super religious astronauts and yes. there are definitely some atheists. Eh? It's, uh, I don't think it changes, and you, you might think it would, I think it just deepens your convictions, whatever they may be when you go to space. And as far as superstitions, we definitely have some, I'm gonna call them traditions. Uh, on the shuttle, for example, and I've started this with my uh, SpaceX crews, after we get suited up, while we're waiting to go outside, because everything is choreographed literally down to the second, and generally we have a little bit of time to kill, we play a card game, and we can't leave until the commander wins the hand. So that's <laughs> a silly tradition. Probably the most famous tradition is a Russian one, which, which is... Shot of vodka? No. No, well, first of all, they do, they do have a glass of champagne, which that's not so unusual. What's unusual is everybody, after the, they drink the glass of champagne, and this is hours before launch, Everybody, everybody meaning the immediate family, um, the crew, the backup crew, the flight surgeons, the operations team, so maybe 15 people. Everybody abruptly sits on the floor, says nothing. Everybody stands up. They go out the room, and the last person out closes the light and throws a champagne glass against the wall. No idea where that started. But what the Russians do is if something works, they stick with it. They never change. And so you probably have heard that Yuri Gagarin, on the way to the launch pad, had to go to the bathroom. Hmm. So they stopped the vehicle, he got out, and he urinated on the right rear tire of the vehicle. And every Russian cosmonaut since then has gotten out no. at the same spot and urinated on the right rear tire. True story. Wow. <laughs> what is a moment that you will never forget? In space. EVA, so as I, I think I mentioned this, but if I didn't, when we are um, doing a spacewalk, you're super under the gun in terms of you know, pressure. You've got the ta tasks to do, you have limited consumables, so you really want to get through what we call the timeline on time. Um, so you're, unfortunately, you don't have much time to appreciate the beauty of, what, of what's happening. However, on this one EVA, we had to wait for some thing, some reconfiguration step from the ground. And so my partner and I, I was actually taste, testing the safer backpack, the rescue device. Mm -hmm. So his feet were in the, in the uh, robotic arm foot restraint. The arm was stretched out as far as it could go. He was holding me, basically. And we were coming up over Mexico from southwest to northeast. At the sun was at high noon. So the colors of the Caribbean were splendid, and there is nothing like the waters uh, around the Bahamas when, when it comes to visual beauty. The turquoise color is spectacular. And that image, 
with the space shuttle sort of in the foreground and the Bahamas in the background was like seared into my head. Did it change you? I mean, there's been a lot of talk about this, uh, what was it called, the, the, the overview effect or the, the blue marble effect. Uh, did that change you seeing Earth from there? On my first mission when I came back, I was convinced I was completely changed and I was going to be a different person. And then a week later, <laughs> you know, I, well, not so much. I, I still had to pay bills and, you know, all those uh, mundane earthly things. But one thing sticks with you and that is the sort of sense of humility and, and relative size, how small we are when we're in space, when you see that view and you feel a connection to both the planet itself, weirdly, because literally you can, you can feel like you can put your arm around the globe. I mean, that's the perspective that you have. And when you look away, it does not look so inviting. And so you have this sense of connection that you want to protect the planet, but also you don't see borders between countries, of course. Uh, you don't see conflict, you don't see disease, you don't see hunger. It looks beautiful, looks peaceful, and it's hard to understand how we don't appreciate this better and how we can not stop having conflicts over territory or religion or whatever the mm. argument may be. And you come back, I think, a more tolerant person and a, a, and a more humble person for sure. So it's not a 180 degree shift, but it's, uh, it's incremental and it sticks. And I think each time I feel it more and more. And that's why it's important for more and more people to go to space. Some people say that every politician should visit space. That was my exact thought after <laughs> my first mission. One orbit for every head of state, the world would be a much better place. Well, thank you very much, Michael, for taking the time and spending it with us. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.